So, hello there good people on YouTube, Gavi here again. Um, the Music of Christmas calendar is done and I'm on holiday, which gives me time for uh, woodworking projects, one of which uh, will be this guitar, uh, which is from the early stages of my guitar building uh, when I started out with making those things and as you can see it's obviously uh, my first attempt at um, using marquetry on the guitar um, and I used various bits and pieces of leftover woods for this for example this uh, pear wood that I had for the back and I used beech for the side uh, for the sides which originally was uh, meant for flooring uh, but I used it for this guitar and I made a neck of different different pieces so I had this one piece of mahogany left and I don't even know what this is this looks a bit like oak to me and then uh, some other mahogany so whatever um, a variety of leftover bits and pieces um, when I made the veneer uh, with the scenery here for this guitar um, I was a bit worried that I would send through the veneer when I originally built it so I layered the veneer and I made it thicker than it necessarily needed to be um, and of course it doesn't benefit the sound too much because it keeps the sound at the thickness that I have it from from swinging I mean it's it's not a bad sounding it has a sustain and it has it has substance and everything but the sound, of course, is not as defined as it could be. And back then I didn't know so much about how to counter the veneer by bracing the guitar um, appropriately so that it would um, allow for more swinging. And I didn't know about voicing tops and anything. So, um, still, it's not a bad guitar. And this one uh, I will give to a refugee girl from Ukraine who will start out at our school in January and she said uh, that she wanted to learn how to play the guitar but I assume due to her flight from Ukraine she doesn't have any so I will give her this guitar she doesn't know about that but since I like the design of it um, I want to build kind of a replica of this but with the knowledge that I have today so I will I will make this <laughs> scenery again or a similar scenery a night scenery with this deer and when I made this, I first made uh, the veneer uh, and then only I realized that I have to put <laughs> on the bridge, which was quite okay because it just touches the deer here so that it seems as if the deer was nibbling on the bridge. For the replica that I'm going to build, I might shift a little bit to the side. Um, and for this, I will be using... Um, this top that some of you might remember of watching my other videos that I call the chubby chicken where I tried out to uh, make this hummingbird image but the hummingbird turned out a bit too big and too chubby so I call this the chubby chicken so this Sitka chubby chicken will be the source uh, for the new guitar and um, I will be using ambrosia maple for the back and sides um, in my guitar building class, two people are building with this material and um, when we bent the sides the other day, it turned out to really, really behave well with that and I hope, yeah, I've always liked maple guitars, so why not give it a try. So this will be the body, this will be the top and there will be most likely a mahogany neck on it. Um, if you want to be part of the journey, watch the video or the series of videos, I don't know how I will do it this time. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy, stay healthy, and as always, be a good person. So for this video, I decided to make a voiceover explaining a bit about the things I'm doing. Um, I have laid out my night scenery on the transparency, which I'm using here to transfer uh, the actual lines to the pieces of wood that I will have to cut. Um, I have tried out several methods of cutting the wood 
And I think it depends a lot on what kind of wood you're using, if it has a lot of tear out, if you're cutting against the grain, um, how wavy it is. And here I tried with a very thin bit um, and the Dremel because I thought I could produce a very, very clean cut line. But this didn't work out too well. Uh, mostly due to the fact that the one piece of wood was very, very wavy uh, and the bits would, would break. Um, so after the initial attempt at trying to cut it with the Dremel, I went back to using my hands and a scaffold for the other pieces. But before I did that, I tried to flatten out the other pieces of wood by, as you can see it here, spraying it with water and uh, then ironing it a bit so that I would have a flatter piece to go with. Oh, I remember that. This worked all right. Um, it didn't take out all the waviness of the wood, but it sure helped it a bit. Um, when the wood is not that wavy um, and not that figured, it's easier to cut it with a scalpel. So once a piece is cut, I'm fitting it to the neighboring piece and I'm putting it together with a few strips of tape so that it stays in position before I add the next piece. Some of the wood is very brittle and um, that makes it difficult to cut. But if you want the different woods to make the scenery and you need the different colors, that's a sacrifice you have to make. And of course, it is a lot of fiddling around until you finally have um, everything in the right position. So you can imagine it's not that easy to make all the pieces fit together, so it takes a lot of fiddling around, um, some sending here, some cutting there, until I'm satisfied. After I've cut uh, and put in the last piece, I flipped the whole thing over and uh, I put super glue where two pieces meet each other. And I do that in order to stabilize the whole thing 
uh, and to make sure it's not only held together by the tape that I'm putting on. Well, and after the glue is hard and has dried, I'm scraping away all the excess and then I send it or rough send it to a, a flat surface because this is what I'm going to glue onto the actual top. What you unfortunately couldn't see me do in the video because the camera wasn't running uh, was apply two thin layers of glue to the top and to the veneer. Uh, I let that sit for an hour so that it would dry um, so that basically both pieces are, are covered in almost completely dry wood glue and now I'm putting them together by ironing the veneer onto the top. You can see how the top is bent uh, from the moisture of the wood on the one side. So flip it around, get my hot iron and that makes the two pieces uh, stick together. So I keep ironing that until I've got a good, good glue contact. This is a satisfying process that I like a lot, um, which is funny because I don't like ironing my clothes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't like it the least bit, so I just don't do it. Well, I finally built myself an improvised drum sender for my guitar building class at school. And that's the workshop at school where I'm thicknessing uh, the sides. And with this soft maple that uh, went very easily and I've got the flexibility that I need very quickly. So after that it's ready for bending, which means that I put uh, the pieces inside my steam box, divided by a spreader so I can steam both pieces at the same time. And um, given the different kinds of materials I use, uh, the sides stay in for between 20 and 30 minutes. This soft maple doesn't take this long, so about 20 minutes later I'm taking the first piece out. And now I've got to be relatively quick in order to bend the sides because this only works as long as the wood is still hot. Here I'm lining up the edge of the side um, with the edge of my bending jig and then I've got a couple of different sized uh, beach dowels wrapped in a towel. So when I press them into the waist of the guitar uh, or clamp it down there. The dowels move around and due to the different sizes they make for an adjustable uh, jig for the waist no matter what kind of guitar I'm currently building. I've said this, uh, in previous videos that I only build guitars from materials that can be steam bent um, and I've done a couple without that technique but bending over a hot pipe but I don't find that very satisfactory and this method limits me to certain species of wood but it is quick, it is simple and um, I rarely had problems with it. Uh, once, uh, when I bent a cut away, uh, it cracked a bit, but I could fix that later in the build process. And there you go. I let it sit for 24 hours and then I can continue. These are strong clamps, man. 
24 hours later, I take them off the bending jig and I'm putting them into the respective mold here for cutting the sides to length so that I can put in my neck block and my end block. In order to do that, I align the sides and I clamp them inside the molds and then they're ready for cutting. In the meantime, my top is ready for the next step and here I'm just cleaning away all the super glue residue and I don't want to send it uh, yet because uh, I might go through the veneer so I'm doing this with a razor blade which gives me a lot of control about what area I'm working and what I'm taking off. Since the top that I used for this guitar already had the sound hole cut out, um, I need to relocate the middle of that in order to use my Dremel to cut out the new sound hole. Thankfully, that's one of the few things I remember from maths lessons, how that goes. Geometry was my thing, algebra. Don't know much about algebra. Says it all. Well, clever as I am, I realized I could have left the veneer in uh, and the new center of the sound hole in order to make the new rosette for the guitar. But I didn't think of that, so I have to relocate the center again, which I've done uh, before. And now I'm gluing the top with double-sided tape to my circle cutting board. And then I will use the Dremel again to route the channel for the new rosette.
depending on what kind of material I use for the rose set, uh, I'm using different kinds of glues. In this case, I've got abalone and uh, celluloid, so I'm using super glue for that in this case. In former times, I only used relatively thick pieces of wood for my neck block, but these days I'm adding a fingerboard extension uh, to support the fingerboard where the neck and the body meet. For those of you who know my uh, previous videos, this is still wood that's left from the renovation of our school's Ola. I've got a couple of pieces of left that I use for neck blocks and back blocks, and I'm rounding over the edges to give them a smoother look. Okay, um, after jointing the two halves for the back, I'm joining them here um, using glue and this little jig that I made myself, which basically is I just put threaded inserts into my workbench and to that I can attach the two boards you can see here and I use them and this triangular piece of wood for wedging um, the two pieces of wood that I want to join in. So I thought of building a fancier jig for joining my sides, but this procedure has worked well for me, so I'm cleaning away the glue, put on my good old car battery as a weight so that the sides wouldn't bulge up, and uh, that was that. All the different guitar shapes that I built have uh, a flat neck block, meaning that my jigs are designed in a way that when I put in the neck block and glue it to the sides, uh, I end up with a relatively flat surface already, uh, which makes fitting the neck later a lot easier. I know that some people have rounded neck blocks, but that makes fitting the neck a bit more difficult because you would have to adjust for the rounded surface. I'm aligning my center line so that I can just put in a straight piece of wood along which I make my cuts to cut the sides to length.
Okay, aligning the back block and the neck block with the lines. And I'm using two small clamps just to keep it in position to see whether it sits in the right place. Make some adjustments before I put in the big clamps. When it comes to bracing guitar tops, most builders uh, use spruce wood for that, and normally I do that too. But when I build the two fundraising guitars and had the raffle, I um, used mahogany for one of the guitars, namely the dreadnought, and that turned out really, really well. So that um, I am using both for this build. I'm using mahogany for the back and spruce for the top of this red node. And uh, what this will lead to is a stiffer back bracing and a more loose top bracing. Uh, I don't know what that will do to the sound, but we will see in the end of the video. For the back bracing, I normally transfer my 15 foot radius and then pre cut it on the bandsaw before I go to my radius dish and then fine send it to the final shape. I don't do that with the top bracing anymore because I have a 40 foot radius there and that's easier to just send it in the radius dish than trying to make such a shallow cut. The celluloid material of my rosette is a bit proud of the surface and I'm taking off as much as I can with a razor blade. Um, this way I don't have to do so much sending because I'm scared of sending through the thin veneer, thus ruining all the work I did prior to that. When I cut out the back, uh, I always make sure that I've got enough material left um, to put two pieces together for my headstock because I normally make that out of the same material uh, that the guitar's body is made of.
and here I've got the two pieces for the headstock veneer. There are different ways of transferring the radius to the sides of the guitar. I do it uh, like this, that I put in the sides into the dish, uh, in the mold, and then I raise the mold so, with pieces of wood so that the pen that I run along the radius dish lines up with uh, the edges of my two blocks, of the neck block and the back block, thus transferring the radius onto the sides. And now I do have a line and I know where to cut or uh, to plane, depending on what material I have. I either cut it if I can't plane it or I plane it to the line and later I find send it in the dish. When one side is radius, um, I put it in its respective radius dish and then I work the other side. Um, and that gives me a good reference point if both sides are the same height. I measure that later in the process when I'm sending it in the radius dish, but for now, uh, the m closer I can get to the final eye by... Um, Cleaning it, the less work I have to do with the sending in the radius dish. So the better I've worked before with my planer, the less of this wiggling around and sending I have to do, which is not one of my favorite jobs to do. It's always nice to see the outcome, but it is uh, physically quite straining particularly when you can't breathe so well wearing a respirator or a mask. So I'm doing this weird dance for both sides, uh, but due to the fact that I do not want uh, a radius, on my neck block and my fingerboard extension I thought to flatten that out again uh, but with a slight angle that goes along with the neck angle where the body and the neck meet. So here I'm checking out the evenness of my surface in both directions and whether I've got the right angle. Uh, and I'm good to go. And then the next step is to simply saw off the fingerboard uh, extension to the right length. This, on the other hand, is a very satisfying process and uh, it gives me great joy to put in the curving for a guitar.
I have not yet found the time um, to build an appropriate dust collection for this drum sender that I made. So right now I'm just running the pipe of a vacuum cleaner over it, which does some good, but it's still very, very messy. Um, but I can use this now for thicknessing tops and backs and the stiffness and the flipping tone are indications for me, which I'm checking out here. If I get that flipping tone, meaning it produces a sound like thunder. Um, I can't explain it any better, but when I hear that sound, I know that I'm very close to where I need to be. And here we are with some more sending after the curtain is in to make it a perfect fit for the back to go on. Okay, I'm checking for symmetry here and equal height on both sides from this direction and from the other one. Uh, later I will measure that, but I already know that I'm very, very much where I need to be. And finally putting in the bracing on the back uh, with my new go bar deck that I moved to the aisle. It's not as comfortable, um, particularly when filming, but it's uh, installed there, it's out of the way. Normally I put a chest of drawers there um, when I'm not using it as a go-bar deck, it works as a shelf. I've already made the two cuts for joining the X bracing, but it wasn't deep enough, so I need to go there about half a mil deeper with each cut. And then I use a chisel to take out the material I don't need. And the last bit is just to clean that um, so that I have a tight joint with my two X braces. So after gluing the braces together, I send them in the radius dish again in order to take off some glue residue or whatever tiny little bit of material may be there in order to make sure that the bracing will stick very nicely to the top. Of course, the other braces need to get that 40 foot radius as well. And I'm always checking whether I've got perpendicular blue surface. I don't want the brace to be tilted, so I try to run it as straight in my dish as I can, all the time checking. When I'm bracing the top, I start with the X brace and the transverse brace. Um, and I don't put on other things normally at this step because that gives me better access to the braces so that I then can use my thumb plane to thin them out towards the top so that I do have height but not thickness. These thumb planes um, are not the cheapest of tools, but they are really, really good and useful. They work well and it's a joy to work with them. And I do like the tiny design of it. I think they're really cute. So 
So what I'm trying to achieve here is a triangular shape of the braces so that they thin out towards the top. They keep their height, but they're getting thinner so that I get uh, less weight, but still stability. When it comes to chiseling, I normally start from the outside of the brace. As you can see here, relatively aggressively before I work my way back um, to where the brace needs to be thinned out. And then I, of course, get a little slower. Trying to take off the material in one go. Many people start bracing their backs by putting in that reinforcement strip where the two halves meet um, before they put in the bracing. I do that later because it gives me free access to the braces so that I can work on the bracing first, um, planing it and so on before uh, this strip keeps me from doing that properly. So. This is my method. Since it's there for stability issues only, it doesn't matter, I think, whether it goes in first or second. Okay, marking where the braces will go so that they can cut the slots for those into the sides. And of course, that's the next step, cutting the slots for the braces to go in. I needed to deepen that cut a bit and now in order not to break the curving I'm going from the inside. Sometimes that happens and the tiny pieces break off when you try to chisel them away. Mm-hmm. 
I wasn't entirely clever with this because I cut my channel the wrong way around so that the V would open up to the bottom and not to the top as it's usual. So what I decided for is to make a parallel cut, so not a V-shaped uh, cut, but just a straight strip covering where the sides join. So after the glue up, I cut off the excess wood and then I use a small plane to take down anything that's proud of my inlay. The closer I get to my final height, uh, the easier it is to send down the rest of it later. Time for the side bracing, uh, and I use these cut-off pieces for doing that. I don't have a specific rule of how many and where they go, but I've got a rubbery ruler, the green thing that you can see here, and I put that in, and uh, depending on the guitar's size, I go in between 11 to 13 centimeters, roughly, so that I've got five braces on each side. Um, I don't think they they do anything to the sound, but they give stability, Ooh, and that's what they're there for. I cut them to size, send them, glue them in, and that was that. So again, working on the braces, and as I said before, I like doing it now um, because I do have free access to the braces, which wouldn't work if the other braces were already in. So for the main braces, I'm doing it like that. In former times, I uh, put the top and the bottom onto the guitars in my Go Bar deck, but these days I'm not doing that anymore. Um, I sandwich it between the two radius dishes, or in this case, I just uh, align the bottom, use some tape, 
to keep it in place and then I put the bottom radius dish on, turn the whole thing around and apply some pressure using clamps. If you do it this way, you can easily see if there is any glue squeeze out and you can clean out things easily if you don't sandwich it between the radius dishes. But I do both. And if I do the sandwiching thing, I will have to clean any squeeze out glue later. But it's of course easier when it's still fresh. So this is preparing the back plate. I'm cutting out a strip of mahogany that I will cut in different pieces for a couple of back plates actually. Flush mm -hmm. trimming the edges with the sides and then I use a hand uh, sanding block to get rid of any sharp edges or whatever I may have produced here. This is the mahogany strip that I just cut out on the bandsaw before and I'm marking out the position of my bridge plate from it and of course cut that to size and then I radius it in the dish before I glue it on. And the same goes for the sound hole reinforcement strips. And this is basically the same procedure as with the bottom. I position the top, mark where the braces go, then I cut the braces to size and I voice the top and I do that by tapping uh, and by checking out for the flexibility so that I get a lot of good notes, uh, the wood ringing with tones, musical tones, rather than just giving a plonk plonk sound. You go more for a boing. And then I cut out the slots for the braces, put on the top, and then finally glue it on using the same method as before, namely putting the respective dish on it and applying some pressure with clamps.
So now that the box is closed, I'm putting on a couple of layers of troil onto the top. Um, this is because, as I said before, some of the wood is very brittle and I kind of want to protect it from two things. Number one, from too much tear out when I cut the binding channel later. And secondly, I want to protect it from any glue residue when I uh, put on the binding later, because if I have to send that off, that means that I might send through the veneer and I don't want to do that. So I'm protecting it by putting on true oil, wet sending it already with that so that any pores fill with the sawdust, uh, true oil mix, and then we're done. So, you sit and rest. <laughs> 